Hello, everyone, and welcome to our March Women's History webinar. This is our second one that we're hosting here at Echam Township. My name is Heather Cooper. I'm Councilwoman Liaison to our Human Rights Advisory Group, and I'm here tonight with these amazing ladies. I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, investing in some time here to share in the women's history topics tonight. I will turn it over to our amazing moderator, Vice Chair Fatima Hayward, and want to also welcome our Chairwoman, Coriel Bukun, who is here with us tonight. So thank you guys for being here. I'll allow the introductions to continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Heather Cooper. We genuinely appreciate all that you do for us. And it is very exciting to be able to be among so many dynamic, wonderful women. Um, again, I also want to just thank our wonderful Chairwoman Coriel, as well as Dr. Vanita Ganju, who has been really instrumental in organizing this event that we are bringing to you today. Um, with that being said, I will officially introduce myself. My name is Fatima Hay Hayward, and as the Councilwoman said, I will be um, the moderator for tonight. I am extremely excited to really start having a deep dive into the topic of today. Um, just some initial background on me. Um, I had actually worked for Planned Parenthood of Northern Central and Southern New Jersey, as well as Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey as a reproductive justice and community partnerships manager. I also served as the Thrive New Jersey Maternal Justice Subcommittee co-chair alongside the incomparable Crystal Charlie, who is just a powerhouse in the state. So to moderate this and to be able to bring my experience um, into the fold really means a lot. So just thank you all for the opportunity in that regard. But with that being said, we have some dynamic women here tonight, um, all who are doctors and are doing everything they can to advocate on behalf of women's wellness, as well as reproductive justice. I'm going to kick it off by introducing Dr. Pamela Brook, who is a board certified um, obstetrician, as well as gynecologist in New Jersey, um, who is also the founder and president of the New Jersey Black Women's Physicians Association. Um, Dr. Brook has done so many things, and I'm really looking forward to giving her the opportunity be able to share more about the work that she is doing throughout the state and probably beyond. Um, so we will be getting into that in a little bit. But looking at our next panelist that we have that has joined us tonight is Dr. Sipika Tayaji, who specializes in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, she actually conducted her residency in India and the second one here in the U.S. and currently works at Virtua. Um, and then last but not least, we have Dr. Indira Amato, who specializes in pediatrics, and she is the president of the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So as you can tell, we will certainly have an amazing panel who will be dropping some gems and will certainly be providing some insight as we talk about today's topic. With that being said, um, I really would love to kick this off with an initial question for the three of you. You all are advocates of women's wellness and reproductive justice, so I would love to ask each, each of you to please just briefly share your journey on how you chose your profession and how you work to improve women's health. Um, we can kick this off with Dr. Brook. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for uh, having me and including me in this uh, uh, wonderful topic near and dear to my heart. But um, I actually went into medicine based on the fact that I did a summer. I went to uh, Douglas College Rutgers University and I did a summer um, research project and the mice and me just didn't get along. I felt that I needed to work with people and, <laughs> and therefore went into uh, medicine. My uh, journey in, I actually thought I was gonna be a pediatrician, but I changed my mind during, medicine, uh, during my rotations and actually fell in love with OBGYN. And through my years, I have done a multiple of um, initiatives and events uh, dealing with advocacy and education in, mo in mostly very vulnerable populations. Um, and I work a lot in uh, Black and Spanish speaking communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Baruch. I will now open it up to Dr. Amato. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Indira Amato, and I'm a general pediatrician in the South Jersey area. Um, my story actually is the mirror of Dr. Bruges. I went to medical school thinking I was going to be an OBGYN. And while I love delivering babies, I just wasn't very great at taking care of the postpartum women, and it just didn't feel like my fit. And then I went on to my pediatrics rotation and found all these adolescents that I love talking to. And it was a great challenge also to get them to talk to me. And that's the, that I think is one of the most enjoyable areas of pediatrics for me. And so that's how I ended up in peds. The other position that Fatima mentioned, um, I'm the current president of the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And it's through that position that I do most of my advocating for reproductive rights, for adolescents and for women, of course, but from the starting point of for adolescents. And our chapter mirrors the policies of the National American Academy of Pediatrics, where we support all adolescents in their decisions and in their search for care. Thank you, Dr. Tayaji. Thanks, Fatima. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I am really honored to be sharing this platform with these lovely, wonderful uh, women here. Um, my name is Ipika Tiagi. Uh, women's health was my calling from very beginning. My dad was a social worker back in India, and I used to do site visits with him in underserved areas. And I realized that women's health was a very neglected area back home. So, you know, that was my calling for med school. And then I went in med school with the thought that I'm going to be an OBGYN. So I did my residency in OBGYN in India and then followed my husband here to this country. And I did another one for four years. Um, so I'm very passionate about women's health. I enjoy carrying women from all ages, from adolescence to menopause, uh, family planning and menopausal issues is one of my areas I really focus on a lot. Um, I'm also a well-trained robotic and minimal invasive surgeon. So, you know, enjoying all spectrums of OBGYN for now. And I'm working currently as site director of my practice um, at Wachwa Voorhees Hospital. Wonderful. Thank you so much for just giving us a quick snapshot of your journey, each and every one of you. Um, to me, it's always important to really understand kind of how people have ended up in the space that they are. Um, I, for example, do various different things and I never envisioned that I would be doing what I'm doing in today's time. So I think it's just helpful for our audience to get a stronger sense of your background and how you are where you are today. Um, but with that being said, I'm really ready to start getting into the meat and potatoes of today's discussion. So my next question is, what are, in, what are important but often overlooked social determinants of health that influence health outcomes? Basically, what can we do to strengthen health outcomes based on your observations? Um, so I will now go and kick it off to Dr. Amato. So for my population, um, for the pediatric population, I would say the most important um, social determinant of health would be access. And that is something that is very tricky to navigate, especially if you're an adolescent female and you're looking for confidential access to your pediatrician, uh, access to an OBGYN, access to reproduction um, guidance and Planned Parenthood, et cetera. So I think that, um, those health outcomes, health outcomes for that population are very much based on how we can be as open as possible and make it easier for adolescent females to be able to access the um, services they need. One of the things that um, Planned Parenthood, for example, will offer is transportation. But one of the things that we have been advocating for in the um, as members of the New Jersey chapter is for con in terms of confidentiality, um, how can we have conversations with adolescents, document them appropriately, but then at the same time, 
not have um, their parents who always have access to their charts be able to see anything. So EMR, electronic medical records are fantastic. They have improved communication between physicians and their patients significantly. You can log in from home now and chat with your patient. Your patient can, your patient can also see their entire chart. But the one population that I serve, again, that where that is actually a barrier to care is the adolescent population. So those are some of the challenges that, um, that we face, confidentiality again being a huge one in our population. Thank you so much. And I have to just say, I love the fact that you kicked it off by talking about access. Uh, one of the key topics of today is talking about reproductive justice. And we know that that is what is centered when we're applying that lens to reproductive health care. So I appreciate your remarks. And you're also setting us up well for the next question. But before we get to that, I will now open it up to Dr. Tayaji. Thank you. Um, I, I totally agree with Dr. Amado. Access is one of the biggest barrier in healthcare. Um, today's world, whenever I, we talk to our patients, they, they tell me that they have a waiting of four months, five months just to you know get their birth control or just be seen for their menstrual problems. So that access definitely is one of the biggest barrier. Um, another in my opinion and experience is you know, generalization of the population, um, meaning you know, one size fits all kind of theory, which doesn't apply to women of different ages, different race, different ethnicity. Um, so that's also one thing as a provider, um, always try to remember that, you know, this is something of, of, of African-American women health needs are different from and Caucasian women or from a Hispanic women. Um, so that's one thing which is also a big determinant of women's health. Uh, recently, a, um, a study came out, a news came out that maternal mortality is again on the rise now, uh, which, you know, we really worked hard as a community, as a physician community to bring that number down, and it's up on the rise again. And once again, African American population is the one uh, whose maternal mor mortality is highest as compared to other ethnicity. So, you know, medical conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, they tend to be higher in that population and Hispanic population. So I think that also has to be emphasized and, you know, kind of, um, again, one size does not fit all. So that is also one of the determinant in my opinion. Thank you so much, Dr. Brug. Well, I think that it's important to realize that the social determinants of health account for over 75% of your outcome. Medicine alone is basically 20, 25%, depending on what you're talking about. And so when we're talking about the social determinants of health, I mean, in the populations and in the communities I deal with, every single last one has an impact. And every single last one is basically poorly done and taken care of here in not only in New Jersey, but all over the United States. So if you look at economic stability, so, you know, employment, income, uh, your bills, uh, if you, you know, are part of that. If you look at neighborhoods, what are neighborhoods like? Do you have safe places to go? Do you have parks? Do you have walkability? If you're talking about education, we just got pre-K, three-year-old pre-K in New Jersey, one of the richest states in the nations right? We just got it. We're, you know, and, let, you know, we, and then we can go into all of the other educational levels that are, that have impacts. Next, next, other one is food. We don't do well. We have so many people that are so vulnerable to hunger. We have so many people that don't have access to healthy choices. And we just don't deal with that well. We're, you know, the other ones are our community and within that and all the social contexts that go with that, including uh, stress, discrimination. And so we have to deal with racism and then support systems that we have around people that are vulnerable. And the last, but definitely not the least, is our healthcare system coverage. We're a country that we're, we still don't have everyone that's eligible for insurance have insurance, right? 
And then we have deserts. Even in New Jersey, we have a maternity desert, you know, that's well known. It's around the Trenton area, you know, and how do we deal with it? And then we have to deal with cultural, you know, I don't even want to use competency anymore. I think it's, we need to use the word cultural humility along that includes racial competency. And all of those things with quality of care are all the things that determine your health. And we just don't do it well. Thank you, Dr. Baruch. Always can rely on you to call it out. And that's exactly what needs to happen. And that's why we're having this discussion. I also want to um, welcome the panelists to feel free to feed off of maybe what a fellow panelist is saying. Um, as I am guiding the conversation, I most certainly want it to be organic. So if there's something that you hear that moves you and you want to add to that, feel, please feel free to do that. Um, so what we're talking about really ties into this next question um, that I have for you all. In order to fight to improve these health outcomes, we must stand up for reproductive justice. So as we work within this framework, why is it vital to have everyone, not just birthing people of color, in the fight for reproductive justice? And I'm going to now pass this back to Dr. Baruch to kick us off. Well, um... One of the things is that we, it's important that we deal with reproductive justice and gender issues. Uh, simply for the fact that we're 50, more than 50% of the population <laughs> and that our beings are essential basically for, uh, for humanity, right? And if you look at any, any injustice that occurs is basically a stain and an injustice on the rest of society. So we can't sit around and say, oh, uh, black maternal mortality is a problem of black people. Or we can't say that uh, uh, abortion rights are uh, a right for uh, the people in urban cities, you know, or, you know, or whatever is said, you know, in that regard. Um, the, it is something that has to be addressed as a society for all people to have the rights and, and the ability to get uh, and to choose, <laughs> most importantly, the care that they desire. Thank you so much, Dr. Tiaji. Um, completely agree with Dr. Bru. Um, you know, we need to talk about these issues. We need to raise awareness about the, these issues. Um, again, women's health has been neglected. A simple example would be, you know, if you talk about um, medications which has been used forever for women like Premarin cream or something like estrogen, which has been used for decades, that medication still costs so much, so much more than $200, $300 for a woman and some women cannot afford it. They do need it versus, women, versus newer medications like for sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction. They are much cheaper. So that, that's just an example of how women's health is um, treated in comparison to other specialities. So we definitely need to talk about it. We need to raise awareness and about this whole new abortion rule. Yeah, I don't wanna get started on that. This is just something which is, which is gut-wrenching to me personally. Um, you know, abortion is a right. Abortion, it, it's an essential part of women's health um, and it should be, you know, we need to talk about these issues. Thank you so much for lifting that up. It's very important for us to be talking about abortion rights because that is also health care. Um, and everybody that is of a birthing stage should be able to have access to quality health care, including abortion. So thank you for lifting that up. Dr. Amato. So not a lot of um, people think about adolescents in this, in this framework in terms of reproductive justice and what um, they're faced with. But when you look at numbers, so for example, there are typically about 750,000 adolescent pregnancies in the US annually, and I'm over 80% of those are unplanned. And that really needs, uh, it emphasizes the need for 
every step, every person in healthcare, regardless of which step or the stage of life that you're involved in, especially pediatricians, to be having these conversations with their patients and be comfortable with offering um, solutions and not just saying to them, all right, off you go, go find an OBGYN. Um, I think that that's a very important concept that we try to stress to all pediatricians that we should be as familiar and as comfortable as Dr. Tiagi and Dr. Brug with uh, managing um, that population and their reproductive needs. Can I just say that, you know, dealing with reproductive needs needs to be ad addressed way before we get into adolescence. And that's one of the problems is now this has become a political issue. And uh, I was at a board of ed meeting <laughs> and I can tell you the comments that were coming on because there's a requirement that you have to have some kind of, you know, sex ed, uh, you know, within school systems at different stages. But the comments were incredible in that it, demonstrated partially an ignorance of science alone, but also of the vitriol that's been created because it is a political issue, but there is a need for it. You cannot delay, you know, there is no way you can have uh, reproductive health if people are not educated about reproduction. And so it's something that, you know, not just us in the healthcare field, but the education, the, the, po the politicians, we need to be able to deal with, uh, deal with this because it is important. You know, I look at, and I'm sure that we've all encountered this when we are encounter patients that even don't really understand how they become pregnant or even don't really understand uh, were a uterus, what a uterus is, or what an ovary is, and what what does that mean? You know, I think it's so essential. I definitely agree. And you mentioned um, a board of ed meeting, which um, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have been attending quite a few of those, or in my case, sometimes staying away because I just. You know, avoidance, it's it's there. It's there among a lot of us, even though we, we feel the, that things are wrong and, and should be corrected. The new education curriculum, which specifies that certain concepts such as gender diversity be included with the fourth, third, fourth, and fifth grade conversations with kids is one that is being opposed in school districts all across New Jersey. And unfortunately, um, even though it's been signed in, the new curriculum has been signed in, each school district still gets to decide how much of it to adopt, uh, et cetera. And that's where, if we're saying that everyone is should be joined in this fight for reproductive justice, and as Dr. Brook pointed out, it starts way before adolescence, those are the topics that we need to be thinking about and teaching that to the younger kids, just accepting that as part of, this is part of your development and not every kid is gonna feel the way you, same way you do about the way they look or about who they are and accepting that. And um, I have to say our, uh, our school board um, is progressing with, the, with putting the curriculum in place, but the opposition and the vitriol that you mentioned were painful to witness. Yeah, I'm sure those meetings are not fun at all. And um, so I recently had this discussion with my sixth grade son who came with this half-baked knowledge of sexual education provided in the school. And it, it, I was kind of very surprised by things he said, which were being told to him, um, you know, so I, I definitely think during these early years, like fifth grade, sixth grade, having them get a session with like a pediatrician, OBGYN, some, some medical knowledge in an easy form would 
would be helpful so that they don't get these misconceptions, you know, some some just random Google ideas. Um, because when I when when I when we have to deliver a 14 year old or 15 year old girl in the hospital, it's 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 just a just an experience which you know it just touches your heart because they really don't know what's going on they really don't know what, what what's happening what they're gonna do with the baby it's 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 yeah it's not very pleasant so I I totally agree with Dr. Brooke that we need to address it in, in much younger years of their growth. Thank you so much for all of y'all remarks in regards to that question. Um, I think that this ties into very well the next question that I have for you. And that is how can folks advocate on behalf of themselves and support access to quality reproductive health care? Um, please share any call to action that you may have for our listening audience. And I will just open it up for whoever would like to kick us off. I think that um, just in general, educating yourself about whatever, why you're entering the medical <laughs> system is important. Um, e you know, even just understanding uh, the basics, say about diabetes or, um, high blood pressure, just the basic information, and then growing in your knowledge in regards to that. Trying to see um, what are things that are maybe new in the horizons? What are things that could be options for you? Um, what are things that you can do on your own to help your whatever your circumstances that you are in that system? But also, what is around you that can help you? Like a lot of these diseases and disorders have organizations that can give you also a helping hand or, and help you to advocate for yourself. Or they may be able to direct you to places that, uh, or centers that could care for you. Um, you know, so it's also that. Um, I think another important part, and you know, it's not considered part of medicine, is voting, right? Vote and vote out people that don't meet your needs, right? Why is that important? Like we are right now protected here in New Jersey in regards to reproductive rights, because we happen to have voted in a governor, right? Who knows who the next governor is going to be? We know what the previous one was and how we lost Planned Parenthood, the funding to Planned Parenthood. So that it's important to understand voting makes a difference on different aspects. If you want to consider social determinants health, and healthcare on its own. So that is a way you can advocate for yourself by voting. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooke. I genuinely appreciate you lifting up the need to vote. Um, personally, in my experience, because I am one of those people who loves to get out the vote, I don't feel as though everyone necessarily always realizes how this directly impacts you. Um, it goes beyond the concept of what some folks may think in regards to the political piece. But with that being said, it's so important for us to vote in the right representation. We need re reproductive health care advocates that are able to make these decisions on our behalf, that are thinking of the people, that are thinking of what we're talking about right now. So I appreciate you lifting that up. Um, when it comes to also, as you said, advocating on behalf of yourself, it's really about you as you yourself. And I just wanted to follow up really quickly and then I'll open it up to the other panelists. Um, do you have any recommended resources or websites that folks can go to? Um, and I did see uh, Dr. Tiaji go off. So whoever would like to actually take this, feel free to. But I think it's important for us to identify maybe some sites that folks can be directed to. Because for me, one of the difficulties as we're talking about access is you don't really know where to go or everything seems to be spread out and all over the place. So if you could help us kind of bring that in a little bit and direct folks to maybe some good resources, I think that's going to be extremely helpful for our audience. 
Um, you know, I can. Oh, go ahead. Please go. I just wanted to um, pitch in saying that how we can, um, you know, promote women's health is um, empowering ourselves and empowering our women friends all around us. Being in leadership roles, being being present, talking about your issues openly. Openly, I know we all have a big laundry list of things to do, but you know, we have to get up that that ladder and climb up to that ceiling. <laughs> So that that would be my my say that you know empower women empower other women and just support each other, encourage each other and talk about issues. Couldn't agree more, Dr. Brute. Did you want to follow up? No, I think that you know in different uh, communities there are community organizations that usually deal with whatever specific topic that you want to consider and just looking on their website, trying to see if you can email somebody, if you need to mm -hmm. speak to somebody, if you can call them to be able to um, be able to advocate for yourself. I know that in regards to maternal health, you know, the NAACP, and we have several in different areas here throughout New Jersey, usually their health committees have some ideas. Uh, there are, you know, uh, uh, melanated mothers, uh, there mm -hmm. are, you know, uh, groups, Black Mothers Matter, you know, that mm -hmm. actually advocate and are on the ground fighting for uh, uh, better outcomes. Um, you know, we do advocacy basically through um, and working with a lot of young people and students at the different universities who become part of our research collaborative and they learn how to advocate also in that regard. So there are different organizations throughout New Jersey, but the important thing is to try to find one that's close, that really knows the resources that are available in your community. Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Amadu, I would love to bring you into the conversation. I think um, what everyone has said is very valid. And also a good way to start is knowing what's going on in your own community. So as I mentioned, even if you don't have a school-age child, come to um, you know, a township board of ed meeting and see what's being discussed and what's uh, happening in terms of who's restricting education or who's fighting for education not to be restricted within your district. And then from that also, knowing what's going on in your own town can open you up a little bit more to knowing what's going on in a larger district, a larger voter district area and look for, like-minded people and organizations like Dr. Brug was mentioning that you can always be a part of. And one thing that always amazed me was the ability of, um, I don't wanna use the word opponents. Okay, fine, opponents, um, for example, a few to mobilize um, masses. A few years ago, our um, chapter was trying to get a bill passed to, have um, personal exemptions removed as a reason not to vaccinate your child. So it was it would be medical exemptions only as a reason to uh, not vaccinate for school age children. And we would turn up on mass in Trenton to testify pediatricians after pediatricians. It didn't matter how many of us turned up. The other side was always able to mobilize more and have more anti-vaxxers out there, et cetera. And that ability has always, you know, like I said, it's always amazing. And I think for us just being part of the community and ready to go and ready to respond to a call to action when there is something like that, I think is very important. And that's a great way for people to get involved, start at the community level and know what's going on in your own town. 
All wonderful gems. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to uplift just some initial resources slash websites I think would be helpful for anyone who may be interested in checking it out more on the national end. Um, I really advise people to check out reproductive justice and maternal justice organizations. Um, Planned Parenthood is absolutely a wonderful organization with a lot of um, great services that are provided, but there is something special when you're focusing on RJ specifically, reproductive justice. Some of those could be the Black Mamas Matter Alliance, um, Sister Song, which is really kind of like a true national leader when it comes to reproductive justice. New Voices for Reproductive Justice is another great example. I would even check out, for example, the New Jersey uh, Black Women's Physicians Association. There are so many different organizations um, that you really can kind of look to for guidance when it comes to understanding reproductive justice. And just to kind of bring this together, because I know we're talking about a term and you're probably more so used to hearing about reproductive health care and reproductive rights. I do want to provide just the actual definition of reproductive justice. Um, and this comes from uh, Sister Song. So Sister Song de defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. The reproductive justice movement specifically centers those who health and, health and rights are most impacted. So that is Black people, people of color, and Indigenous people in the fight for our health care values and civil rights. That is the distinct difference. So as we are advocating and we are fighting for reproductive rights, we should be pushing for reproductive justice, which centers those, as I said, that are most impacted, as well as ensuring that it's not just about you having the right to that specific health care, but you have the access to it. Um, I just think it's really important when we're having these conversations conversations to make sure that we are tying all of that together and ensuring that our audience is aware of what that is. And I think that our panelists have done such a beautiful job of highlighting kind of the different issues and the obstacles and barriers and how we really can combat that. That's what we're aiming for at this point in time, especially as we are celebrating Women's History Month and we're talking about uplifting women and talking about empowering, you know, all that we are known to do. We need to continue fighting that good fight. And that's how you can do that as well. Now, with that being said, I want to open it up to our panelists for one final question, at least for the moderated session, and then we'll open it up for Q&A officially. Um, and please just feel free to share a final message that you may have. Um, anything that maybe you felt so you didn't get a chance to kind of hone in on or share with our listening audience. Um, so I will open it up and kick it off to Dr. Tiaji. Really a great discussion tonight. Um, you know, very... Um, very knowledge-based conversations we did. Um, my my take-home message for the audience would be to, you know, be aware of your social determinant, as Dr. Brooks said, just looking around yourself, knowing your needs. Um, and there's definitely ways which we can help you with. As you mentioned, Planned Parenthood is one way, um, you know, reaching out to your local community, nursing, uh, simple things like birth control uh, that, that started early on. That's one message I would really want to give to the audience there. We should start it early on with our uh, our reproductive health and just taking, taking it in, in our own hands. That's one of the message I would really want to convey to the audience there. Um, and, you know, don't be scared to talk about it. Just reach out for the resources, simple things like you go on hospital websites and you'll see emails for like office manager, practice manager, you could use those forums and just forward it out. Someone will definitely look at it. It might be a delay of a little bit, but but you should you should get a response there. Thank you, Dr. Amato. Yeah, I'll echo what Dr. Tiagi said and say, you know, that you really need to feel that you have a voice and that you can advocate for yourself. And then in that process, um, equally as important is to, for the next generation, for your children, for your girls especially, teach them early on how to have that voice and how to represent themselves, which may even be a little hard in some situations. If they're sitting in the doctor's office, for example, uh, they may not want to speak up and then you may not ask their questions for them because you may not have been ever comfortable speaking up in a, in a physician or medical setting. But um, if they see you doing it and they see you, you know, advocating for them and that way they will also, you know, start from an early age to advocate for themselves. Thank you, Dr. Baruch, bring us home. I think one of the 
things that I didn't get to mention is the importance of history and why we have some of the problems that we have now. So if we're speaking about reproductive justice, especially in OBGYN, we cannot forget the atrocities that were done on uh, black women uh, during and after slavery. And that uh, our, our um, specialty was built on basically the backs of black women. And, and it didn't stop, right? I mean, so we first were felt to be like the breeding ground to have more and more children. And then that slavery was a lot. And then it was like, ooh, how do we stop them from having kids? And then there was a formal sterilization where, you know, I don't know how many people know about, you know, the Ralph's RELF sisters uh, in Alabama are the most uh, uh, famous, but there are hundreds of thousands of forced sterilizations that happen both here and in Puerto Rico and, um, and all done to basically trying to then control the bodies of, uh, of uh, black women. And so I think we also have to lift that up because it has an impact on how we still look at um, birth control or how much trust we have in birth control. And because you're wondering why are they trying to give me so many of us the IUD and why are you trying to give me depo, depo, depo? Because there are things that have been done in the past that continue to have an impact in our present. So I think that's uh, something I always say, you, get, you have to understand the history and how it's impacting us today. Thank you, Dr. Brew, for providing a historical context, um, especially kind of level setting and giving us a stronger sense of the foundation of this and what we are still combating in today's time and how we are pushing still in today's time to change the way that things have been, has happened in the past. Um, with that being said, those were just the initial final remarks, but we will be opening up for Q and A. Um, I do want to uplift something that our wonderful chairwoman has dropped in the chat. Um, it's an interactive educational site, and she'll be sharing more about that. So I will leave that um, to Coriel when the time comes. But I do see that we have a couple of comments slash questions in the chat. So without further ado, I would love to bring Dr. Vanita Ganju into the conversation, who will be leading us through the Q and A session. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the panelists for the moderated piece. It has been a pleasure. And now I will be passing it on to Dr. Vanita. Um, thank you, ladies, for that uh, beautiful insight into women and our rights. We have to stand up for ourselves and we have to speak for our daughters and we have to teach them about how to take care of themselves. So, for example, in my household, we are very open with our child. We talk to her about everything, but maybe that's because we are physicians. But the question comes from one of the audience. Do you as physicians talk with parents about how to talk to their child about, you know, the birds and the bees as they, as they used to call it in, when we were young? So how, how would you advise parents who are very skimish about talking to their kids about, uh, you know, their bodies and how they are going through changes? And what would you say to those parents? I think one of the most important things is to start early and to normalize your body, normalize their bodies to them. No funny cutesy words for your private parts. There's no baby in your belly. There's a baby in your uterus and using the appropriate terms that, you know, from the very beginning, you know, this part of your body is just the same as an arm or a leg. It's a growing part. This part develops a little differently, et cetera. And I think that's extremely important. If parents can get comfortable doing that with their kids from an early age, then it really will help as their kids develop lead to better conversations. 
and to for them to be able to ask the questions. I have had parents specifically say, how are you so comfortable with asking that? I had a mom ask if she could just stay. She said, I knew, I know the questions you're going to ask her. And her adolescent said she was okay with her mom staying. And she just said, I just want to see how you do it. And I said, okay, but just be aware. I'm going to ask the questions. I always ask, even with you here. And she goes, that's fine. And she just kind of sat in the background while I asked, you know, what are you doing? Who are you doing it with? Who are you attracted to? How do you see yourself? Everything. And at the end, she said, you just, you just did it. You just went right through. You kept examining and you just did it. And that's, I said, yeah, because that's a normal part of my, of what I do every day. And you don't separate it out. You don't make it abnormal. You don't make it a big deal as such. You just, from a very early age, start normalizing the conversations. I mean, that's an OBGYN. I would totally <laughs> applaud <laughs> that statement like, hey, that's what we need, right? Uh, I think as young girls, uh, you just, from, you know, I, I'll tell this funny story. Just don't tell my daughter I said it. Um, <laughs> my husband is ultra conservative <laughs> and, uh, my, and I'm the gynecologist and it's, one day my daughter was walking downstairs and she had on a pad and uh, my, you know, menstrual pad and uh, my husband was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And I think she was like three years old. Oh my gosh, what are you trying to teach our daughter? She's only three years old. She's, she won't be dating till she's 30. You know, one of those kind of things, right? I'm like, oh yeah, sure, baby. <laughs> but you just need to normalize everything that is happening to our bodies. You know, even when I went through menopause, I was telling my daughter, oh my God, I can't, this heat right? I never knew when my mother went to menopause. I don't think she ever mentioned anything about it, right? But I'm like, listen, some of the changes that are happening, mm, you better get ready. No, she's young. <laughs> but I think it's just making it normal. And you do the same thing when you're speaking to parents and guiding them to speak to their, um, to their uh, young girls. I think you have to do the same thing. Um, there is a, um, a book that we put out with Planned Parenthood, and this is specifically for Black young girls. It's called uh, My uh, Black Body is Beautiful. Um, and it has, and, and part of it has to do with reproduction, but also how you see your body. And I think that's also one of the things that we um, and we weren't the only group. There were other uh, uh, Black organizations like Melanated Moms that actually worked on this. But young girls have to see themselves as being beautiful. There's something with our society that has such an impact, especially as they get to school on what is seen as beauty and beautiful. And that so early on, you have there has to be a way that you can actually build up their uh, self-image, right? And how they see themselves. And uh, I say that in that, you know, when she was young, like, you know, you go to uh, back to school and they have the kids drawing their families. And the only thing I cared about is that we were going to be colored black or brown, right? Because I wanted to know that my daughter had a good self-image of herself. And so I think that is part of working with parents to help to build their young girls, their images and their um, self-esteem up. I think is very important because that it has an impact on decision making later on. So I got knowing that we were going to have this discussion. So I have a couple of questions from young girls who might be wa watching it later because they were at sports. So most of these 
athletes or these girls, young girls these days, they are always running around starting at seven in the morning. But when the periods come, then it's a, you know how it is. It's like they have cramps and they are in pain and then they can't take a Tylenol to school. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes I have sneaked it in, but it's what do these, what do you do during school hours? Because if they take a Tylenol in the morning, the whole day can't go by. And do you, it's been a problem. Many times you have to get your child, uh, your daughters out of school because they are having so many cramps. So what would you suggest we, the parents do during those days? So um, there, are, there are multiple options for girls. Young girls can do simple things like a low dose birth control pill can really help them alleviate the bleeding, pain during their menstrual cycles. Periods are going to be much lighter. They can also use the extended regimen and just skip the periods altogether during their sports month or you know their active days. They could just be on the pill every single day. And there are various doses, as I said. So birth control has this notion attached to it with the side effects but you know it has to be education counseling that you know most of the girls they do fine and if they can't take pill there are other methods like depo shot nexpanol long long acting things as well patients who do not want to be on hormones for specific reasons then you know having them take motrin or aleve aleve is a little bit more long lasting so taking in the morning and in in, in the evening, the same day might help them skip their, uh, you know, school school hours. But if they need a script from your do their doctor saying that this patient is supposed to take Motrin during her periods, they can always keep the script with them, keep their Motrin with them, and you know that that's a problem we can easily solve. Thank you, because that is a very common question and issue every month for most of the people, parents who have daughters. What else can we do as physicians or as organizations or people or women to bring down the cost? Because there are all these, you know how it is, the tampons, the pads, they are very expensive. We can afford it, but there are families who are going without food also. So how, how can we help? What can we do? Uh, where, what should we do about the situation? Because many girls do miss their schools because they don't have enough supplies. Not in this area, but in many areas, downtrodden areas, which is, a, which is a problem. So what do we do to solve this? You know, no one knew what to do when the country shut down and everyone had to stay home. All the kids had to stay home. So, you know, um, and eventually, yes, definitely in the lesser served and the, in the underprivileged areas, it was harder for these kids to be remote, et cetera. But I think that sometimes um, in a situation like that, the schools have to be more adaptable, have to be a little bit more flexible. And we've shown that we can, these kids can learn remotely. So, you know, if you can't um, necessarily jump in right away and solve the entire situation, I think showing some flexibility and ability to adapt to the kids' needs would go a very long way. For solutions yeah. to create a problem, I'm, I'm not, uh, that one, I'm, I'm very stumped. There are organizations that actually deal with this problem of access to uh, uh, different items that one would need for their periods. Um, there are uh, even some that are available for in high schools, um, especially I know in the colleges. So in the colleges, they have food banks, right? But they also supply uh, um, period items um, in there. There are also, you know, there was, you know, I don't quote the legislation, I have no idea, but there was even legislation in New Jersey in regards to making sure that these the items are available for uh, people that are incarcerated. You know, um, there, there are things being done. So I would say to, again, try to find out in your community what is being what those organizations are and how you can get a hold. But I think that one of the things is that 
And I think organizations are doing it where we need to demand a change, right? This is not something that is uh, of choice. <laughs> this is something that is needed, right? And demand, you know, the, the cost. You know, everything is about um, how much money I can make. So looking at and seeing what are the prod what are the companies that are giving the products, but you know, they're so good at marketing that this is what the young girls want and and all. Right, really, when you test out the pads, they're basically all the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some may have wings, some may be a little bit longer, but basically they're all the same. So, you know, but being able to sell that <laughs> is a different story. Um, you know, you could use the ShopRite brand or the CVS brand and it would save you about half the amount, but uh, if not more. And I think, uh, I, again, I think uh, there are food banks to, to be really serious, they're carrying products now too, also. I actually just wanted to jump in here really quickly. Um, we have a young woman, she's actually pretty amazing. Her name is Kavya. Um, she's a local high school student and uh, she started her own nonprofit while she was in high school, uh, high school called Tampon Express. And um, she is doing her best to combat period poverty. And also, um, she's also tackling um, the pink tax. So female hygiene uh, items, anything that's really pink um, has a yep. higher tax. You'll see that if you go to get a Gillette razor and you want one that's in pink, um, it's much cheaper to get one that's in black that's meant for males. So that's another thing that she is combating. Uh, she's an amazing young woman. Uh, the educational interactive link um, that I put in the chat actually has a QR code and um, you can click on it as well. And it'll take you to her website. And um, she has drop-off sites. Um, if you are able to drop off um, menstrual products, um, women's hygiene products, you can. I believe the Isham local library is one drop-off spot. She has a few. Um, she also has social media. She's at different township events where she also um, does this. It's something that's a passion project for her. And um, she just really believes in equity and um, basic rights. So amazing young woman. And we have a local organization right here run by a teenager that is trying to combat period poverty. And uh, I just had to give that plug because uh, she's an amazing person doing just work that is so necessary. Yeah. I wish I could do the reactions. I just wanted to have a heart in the corner of my screen for that one. <laughs> right. Just do that. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing, especially at such a young age. Um, mm -hmm. I really do believe the current and the upcoming generation really are our future, and they're going to help us get on track finally. Dr. Vanita, did you have any other questions, or did you want to wrap up Q&A? Yes, I think we can wrap our Q&A. We could talk on for hours, but at some point, if these wonderful physicians are willing to come back, we could talk about endometriosis and menopause, the community. Yes, if we, we need women like you to come and support programs like webinars so that we can share this information with the rest of the community, because not everybody has the time to come out or see their physicians, but if we create these little webinars and post them, somebody who can see it or listen to it at 10 o'clock at night. So it would be nice if you can come and visit us again in the future for more topics to discuss. But we are very thankful that you could join us tonight. Thank you to all the physicians. Thank you very much. I just want to hop in real quick before we pass it to our chair. Um, I did see that our mayor is on, so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge her. Um, thank you so much, Mayor Jacqueline Vizi, for joining. We appreciate your leadership and your support of this event. Um, I also just want to uplift quickly as well that Joanne Weiner had put in some legislation in the chat for anyone who may be interested that is related to feminine hygiene products um, and this accessibility. So make sure you're checking out that chat. But without further ado, our wonderful chair. Can't wait for you to bring us bring us home.
Hi, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you for the panelists to being on, just taking time. Um, I know that you ladies are extremely busy um, because you're not just physicians. You have multiple things that um, you do, your mothers, um, you are entrepreneurs, some of you. So um, just so amazing that you took time to be with us because this is really important. I know that there are a lot of young women um, who tune in because sometimes it is difficult for them to ask these questions. Sometimes they don't feel like they don't feel comfortable asking them um, of their parents. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable uh, asking trusted adults or even their pediatrician, their doctor. So it's really important that they, there's, there are forms like these that exist where they can get um, factual information because sometimes when they go to their friends or the internet, um, chaos can ensue. So <laughs> um, th these opportunities are always amazing. And it opens up other conversations as well. Um, at the very end, um, Vanita mentioned um, endometriosis and um, menopause. Those are also topics that um, we just need so much more information on. So if you guys ever want to um, come back and talk a little bit more about those, um, we would definitely welcome it. The last thing I'm going to do is just put on screen um, the link that I had dropped into the chat, which is just our interactive um, element. It does have uh, Kavya's Q QR code, and if you click on it, it will take you to the website, um, as well as just a couple of infographics um, that we thought were pretty important. Um, uterine, it, one is about uterine um, fibroids, um, which is extremely common in women, especially women of color. Um, and unfortunately, it's not as benign as people might um, assume. Uh, it can cause a lot of different issues. So that's something that I um, definitely want to share in addition to cervical uh, cancer screenings, um, some facts, some quick facts about um, mammographies, um, as well as 21 questions for um, girls under 21 that they can ask their pediatrician or OBGYN. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick, and then we'll sign off. How many years in and still technology? All right, let's see. Ah, there it is. All right. Okay, so this is what um, our infographic looks like. This is what I put in the chat. So um, all of the elements um, that have animation are clickable. And when you do, you'll just see a the infographic pop, pop up that gives you a few facts about um, some really common um, women's health and reproductive issues, as well as some guidance for what you may want to ask at different um, ages of your physician. And then in our top left corner, we have um, a link to Tampon Express. This is Kavya's website. This is the QR code. But also, if you click it, it will take you directly to her website. So um, just wanted to share that really quickly. Um, thank you guys so much for being on. Thank you so much to Fatima Hayward. She did an amazing job moderating. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councilwoman Cooper, for being on. And I hope you guys have a wonderful night. Thank you.